we got to talk this kind of thing up that uh, this has been a let, let me interject that Richard and I are going to uh, go outside the choir. Uh, we are going to be interviewed on The Thinking Atheist this coming week. Oh, that'll be interesting. So it's great to get outside of uh, the normal skeptic choir. Anything that we can do. All right, so I need to end this because we're going to go to our next speaker. But thank you again, Richard. I really appreciate you volunteering. Yeah. All the way from the other side of the world. I'm, I'm glad you're right side up. You had to fix the screen. <laughs> Otherwise, you're upside down there in Australia. We, we all can't be skeptical fairies, I tell you. We all can't just fit around the world. Uh, Michelle, all right. Thank you so much. The Coriolis effect or something. <laughs> okay, so next up, we have the amazing Mono Sigmund, who is going to be, he's, he's uh, spoken to us before in the past about um, uh, different kinds of, there he is, uh, different kinds of, uh, a phenomena or whatever historical fact. I think it was Copernicus the last time uh, he talked to us. He does have at least one, maybe two different videos on our YouTube channel. And um, today he's going to be giving an interesting talk about um, time, which is always appropriate at the beginning of the year to talk about time. And so do you have slides? I don't remember if you said mono. Yes, I do. Uh, okay. And audio? No. Okay. So I'm going to leave it to Mono. He's got he's got the calm, and I will be right here listening in. All right, let's see here. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Good. All right. So thank you, Susan. I know you have trouble with pronouncing words, but I never thought you'd mess up mine. It's not Singman. It's Singham. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. So the question is why the age of the earth has oscillated wildly over time. And this is an interesting topic. And it's really a, a detailed case study that I made of this question that's in my book, uh, The Great Paradox of Science, that was published two years ago. So the short version of this story, for those of you who find it hard to listen for more than two minutes, is that the Earth used to be considered really old, even possibly infinitely old. Then around the year 1650, it became really young, like thousands of years. Then around 1800, it became really old again again, possibly infinitely old. Then in 1850, it became younger again, around hundreds of millions of years. Then around 1900, it became yet younger of the order of tens of millions of years. And around 1950, it became really, really old, billions of years, except for those people who are still stuck at stage number two of thousands of years. But that's really the short version of the story that I'm going to tell you. So initially, the age of the Earth, I mean, when I say initially, I mean, long time ago, it was not really considered an important issue. And there were plausible early theories. One was an infinite age. Another was a finite age, but vast and indeterminate. But there were also ideas of uh, cycles of creation and destruction of the universe. And this can be, these can be found in Buddhist and Hindu cosmologies. For example, in Hinduism, a universe lasts about 4.3 uh, uh, billion years, which is considered one Brahma day. And it's the current universe has been 51 cycles of the current 100 year Brahma cycle. And the current universe is about 156 trillion years old. So there are various uh, people who have calculated this. But the point is that in, in the West, the Bible and Christianity changes things because the genesis and original sin requires a single creation, not a cyclical process with a beginning, uh, with the second coming of Jesus requires an end. You can't have multiple sins and falls and redemptions. You have to have just one thing. And people looked in the Bible for clues about when this might happen. And the six days of creation was 
taken as a metaphor for the earth lasts for 6,000 years, taking one day as equivalent to a thousand years from passages in the Psalm, in Psalms and Peter. And the creation of Adam on the sixth day was taken to imply that Jesus would come again in the last thousand years. And it is this that led to laid the foundation of what we call end times theology, the idea that the end times are near and we need to prepare for it. So this led to uh, calculations of the creation date. In 1650, Bishop Usher took the death of Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar in 562 BCE as a fixed reference point to get that the earth was created in 4004 BCE. Now it is popular to laugh at Usher and say, what a dope to think that the earth was only 6,000 years old. But actually, if you look at the way he did his calculations, it was a remarkably detailed and precise calculation. You have to remember that at that time, the idea that the earth itself might provide clues as to his age was quite un, uh, unthought of. People looked for external sources in the literature. And so he combed through the literature, a vast amount of literature, with the Bible as the main source, but various versions of the Bible to arrive at this. And after going over what he did, my, my um, image of Bishop Usher has improved greatly. I think he was a very careful person. And he was not the only person. Isaac Newton and uh, uh, William Lloyd and the Bishop Wooster and many others got similar results as Usher. They all uh, did similar types of calculations and they got agreement within 50 years. Uh, the reason why Usher's number became so dominant in Christian dogma is that in 1701, uh, the Bishop of Oxford, who was also the controller of Oxford University Press, annotated the Bible, had an annotated version of the Bible where he put the dates ar arrived at by Usher, including the origin date plus the date of Noah's flood and all the other events that Usher calculated. He put them into the Bible and this helped create the creation date become a dogma. So modern science, we can, uh, attempts at answering the age of the earth, we can uh, mark it with Nicholas Steno and Robert Hooke, who found evidence for geological strata, but did not try to use it to estimate the age of the earth. Hooke was the scientist. Steno should be better known than he is. He was actually born a Lutheran, and he had uh, started out studying biology and geology, and he did some very important work in geology and some even consider him the founder of geology. He found, for example, in his work, shell seashells on the mountaintops of, and uh, so did Hook. And they found all this evidence for geological strata. But around the age of 30, Steno, although he was born a Lutheran, converted to Roman Catholicism and became a monk and then later a priest and then a bishop and after that, the age of 30, he really stopped doing any science, which is unfortunate because he seemed to have a real uh, knack for it. But basically, they did not try to use what they found to estimate the age of the Earth. Instead, scientists tried to explain how the Earth's features could have arisen in such a short time of 6,000 years. And this led to what is called catastrophism theory, which was proposed by the philosopher Rene Descartes and Gottfried Leibniz. And basically they said that the major features of the earth like mountains and Grand Canyon and all these other things came because of catastrophes, massive upheavals in the earth. And for example, uh, that the seashells on the mountaintop that Steno found was caused by the Noah's flood. And the, the flood, rather than the earth having been pushed up to a mountain, uh, the great flood covered the mountains and that's how seashells ended up there. So the whole idea of catastrophism was to try and squeeze everything all the features of the earth, the major geological features of the earth into the 6,000 year window, which required dramatic changes. So then we are started having new models of the earth's formation. In 1755, Immanuel Kant and Pierre Laplace created what called the nebula hypothesis of, earth, of earth's formation using Newtonian physics, where they said that basically the earth and all the other planets in the sun were created by clouds of gas and dust particles that coalesced and formed these bodies. And in so they coalesced, formed these bodies, and initially, because of the gravitational and kinetic energies of these, these bodies were very hot. And then over time, they cooled and became the cold earth that we have now. And this model was used by 
uh, George Louis Leclerc, who, the, the count, who's known, better known as Buffon, who used this model and estimated the age of the Earth to be 75,000 years. Now, that's vastly less than our current estimate. But it was the first, but it was important, it was crude because at that time, thermodynamics was its in, in its infancy and thermometers weren't really widely available. So he had to, to do his calculations, he had to estimate the hotness of bodies by just holding them in his hands, which of course is very crude. So he arrived at 75,000 years. And the significance of Buffon's calculation was that it was the first clean break with biblical chronology. It's, it just signified a complete break with a 6,000 year old age. And it even led to demands by the theologians at the Sorbonne that he publish an apology for contradicting the Bible. And he refused to do that. Then geology and paleontology emerge, the fields of geology and paleontology. And in 1785, James Hutton proposed the idea of uniformitarianism, which is, and he suggested the possibility of an infinitely old earth that might last forever. Uniformitarianism said that unlike catastrophism, changes occurred very, very slowly over time. And the earth was created over a long period of time. And paleontologists like George Cuvier and Jean de Baptiste Lamarck suggested that the ordering of the fossils in the earth implies that geological formation was slow. So the idea was that the simpler fossils were deeper down in the strata and the more complex fossils were higher up and that this that signified the slow change of fossils along with the uh, uh, with the being buried in the uh, ground. 1830 marked a major uh, arrival. Charles Lyell uh, argued for actualism. He said, what he said was that by observing the steady rate of change of major geological features now, you could cal actually calculate the age of the earth. For example, by looking at the rate of erosion now, and extrapolating it back, you could see tell when the earth began. Similarly with the sedimentation and the salinity in water, by looking at the rate of sedimentation now and calculating back, you could see when the sedimentation started. And he published three volumes called The Principles of Geology. The first one was in 1830, where he outlined this uh, model. And it was a very, very influential book, a series of books. So around 1850, the consensus among scientists was that the fossils and the geological, geological features required the age of the earth to be at least tens to a few hundreds of millions of years of age. And this is very important, that year is very important because this gave enough time for Darwin and Wallace's theory of unguided natural selection to work. So the, Darwin and Wallace's model required slow changes in organisms to accumulate over time to provide major changes. And that clearly required a long time. And when they published in 1858, at the time that Darwin and Wallace were working, they had this large window of time of hundreds of millions of years with which to play with. So they were unhindered by time limits. But we should remember that many scientists of that time were religious people. They were, and mostly Christians in the West. And they were bothered by da Wallace, Darwin and Wallace's theory of unguided natural selection, where natural selection worked without any external supernatural agency guiding the process. So the religious scientists of that time preferred what would be called guided natural selection that would require a hidden force such as a supernatural agency to guide uh, the selection process. Just as if you are a plant breeder, you can <coughs> produce new varieties much more quickly than by just letting plants grow randomly and hoping that things will work out well. So guided natural selection requires less time than uh, un unguided natural selection. So Kelvin was one of those people <coughs> Kelvin, <coughs> excuse me, he opposed the ideas of an unchanging earth, indefinite age, and unguided evolution. Kelvin was a religious man. I mean, when I say religious scientists, at that time, none of them had thought of a 6,000 year old earth. That they had given up. They also all believed in evolution. The key issue was between guided and unguided evolution. 
So what Kelvin did was he introduced rigorous physics into geological studies. And he repeated Buffon's calculations more sophisticatedly. Kelvin is considered the father of the field of thermodynamics, and he could do those experiments much more precisely than Buffon could have hoped to do. So what were Kelvin's assumptions? He assumed that once the earth was formed, its interior was rigid and homogeneous, the same everywhere. He also assumed that the earth's and sun's energy originated as gravitational and mechanical energy with no other source of energy. And that made the earth into a hot molten ball that gradually solidified and cooled. The results using this model, in 1862, Kelvin arrived at 20 million years. It could only last for 20 million years. Uh, the sun, sorry, could last for only 20 million years. He said the earth could last anywhere between 20 and 400 million years. By 1868, the upper limit had been reduced to 100 million years. In 1893, Clarence King, the first director of the US Geological Survey, arrived at a figure of 24 million years for the earth. And this figure was endorsed by Kelvin. So by 1895, the physics consensus arrived at estimates of 20 to 40 million years for the age of the earth. But this was a problem for biology geologists who said that the sedimentary record needed at least 100 million years to work, perhaps a few hundred million years. And biologists needed at least 200 million years for unguided natural selection to work. So around the turn of the 19th century, there was an impasse between what the geologists and biologists needed and what the physicists were saying. Physicists tend to be the dominant science at that time. So they tended to hold more power. Darwin was not happy with this state of affairs. And in 1880, two years before his death, he wrote what was his last words on this subject. What he said was, with respect to the time, lapse of time not having been sufficient since our planet was consolidated for the assumed amount of organic change, and this objection, as urged by Lord Kelvin, is probably one of the gravest as yet advanced, I can only say, firstly, that we do not know at what rate species change as measured in years. And secondly, that uh, many philosophers are not yet willing, sorry, Not, not yet willing to admit that we know enough of the constitution of the universe at the, and of the interior of our globe to uh, estimate accurately the age of the earth. So basically, da Darwin was hoping that something would change that would enable him, uh, the age of the earth, to become longer. And he was right. The physics consensus started to get unraveled. In 1895, physicist John Perry argued that Kelvin's assumption of a rigid homogeneous earth would not work. He said the convective flow and inhomogeneity in the earth's interior would change Kelvin's estimates upwards by as much as a factor of 100. And in 1896, Oxford biologist Edward Poulton dared to suggest at a meeting of the British Association that Kelvin might be wrong. This was very daring because Kelvin was considered almost like a scientific god. And to argue that he was wrong was very bold at that time. But as a result of this work, the age of the earth uh, was rapid. Uh, what radioactive, in 1900, radioactivity was discovered. And that gave us a new me method of determining the ages of the earth by measuring the ages of rocks. And rapidly, the ages started going up as new older and older rocks were discovered. In 1905, the age of uh, the oldest age was 145 million, 41 million years. Then it went to 1.64 billion years, then 1.9 billion years, then 3.35 billion years, until finally in 1953, we arrived at pretty much what the figure we have now, which is 4.5 billion years. But note that before 1940, the age of the sun was still assumed to be 20 million years. So we had the odd situation before 1940, between 1900 and 1940, where the earth was thought to be older than the sun, which of course was uh, implausible. But fortunately in 1940, thermonuclear energy fusion was seen, was discovered and was seen as the energy fusion source of the sun. And the age of the sun rapidly shifted to 4.6 billion years. 
solving that problem. But then there was an unexpected new problem. In 1915, the general theory of relativity by Einstein introduced, Einstein introduced the general theory of relativity and the static universe. In 1922, the universe changed from being thought static to be an expanding one. And 1927, we had the Big Bang Theory and the Hubble's law, which said that the velocity of the receding galaxies was proportional to the distance. This law was actually proposed by Lemaitre. So this was enabled people to calculate the age of the universe or estimate the age of the universe. And in 1929, the initial data estimated the age of the universe as 1.8 billion years. But that was a problem because at that time, the age of the earth was more than that. So we had a problem where the age of the earth seemed to be older than the universe. But that problem too went away. With the use of Einstein's general theory of relativity and uh, the Einstein general relativistic field equations describe the universe and with the certain assumptions that the universe is currently flat, what we call is the total density of the universe is equal to its critical value. We now feel that the mass density, the density of ordinary matter in the universe is about 5%. Dark matter is about 26% and dark energy is 69%. These are the best estimates that we have for the universe as a whole now. And using those, we can actually calculate, uh, get an expression, a simple expression for the age of the universe, which is this one. Now, some may wonder whether I, it's, I should call this simple because you have this inverse hyperbolic tan function, tangent function. But what I mean by simple is that you, this age, T, depends only on two things. <laughs> the ratio of the dark energy density to the total energy density and the current value of the Hubble constant. And if you know those two numbers, you can take your iPhone out and uh, its calculator feature will enable you to calculate this. And I've done it for you. And here you get that the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. So this is where we stand now. Finally, as of today, the age of the earth is believed to be 4.5 billion years, which is less than the age of the sun, which is 4.6 billion years which is less than the age of the universe, which is 13.8 billion years. So we can see that, or say that all's well, that ends well. Oops. At least for now, until something maybe comes along that upsets this sequence. But right now things are good. All right, thank you. That's my talk. Any questions? Thank you, thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Let me get to the, Adrian, can you pin me please? I would appreciate that. Mana, you should know that if, if a word can be mispronounced, you know I'm going to pronounce it. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's just, there's just no way I'm, the more I look at it. I'm teasing you. I know, I know, I know you are, we're good friends. Uh, with, with Kyle, I had I had his name written on a darn post-it for two weeks. It's been sitting here to look at it, to say it correctly, poll itch. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as we started talking and I was introducing him, <laughs> totally forgot about it. But <laughs> anyway, really interesting. I had no idea. Um, there's a few different comments in here. GY, people weren't sure what GY means and uh, they explained that's giga years or giga equals a billion. Is that yes, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, episode one of the Good Omens tells the tale, or should I say, God tells the tale about uh, about this story or something like that. I, I guess Good Omens is a podcast. I haven't heard of that. No, 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 no. Good Omens is a book uh, uh, by oh. Gaiman and became um, a limited series. A excellent, very funny limited series. If you get a chance to see it, you should see it. Okay, fantastic. From Jay, very, very funny. That was a discussion in the chat, not regarding what Mana was saying directly, but it was about that, uh, what the age of the earth, what day was it created on? So we were having some argument about that. Yeah, we've yeah. been, do you know what yeah. day? Because we're hearing Thursday. Uh, no, no, no. Wednesday All right. I found, I found the citation. Bishop Usher said it was a Sunday because, hey, that's the holy day. It had to be on Sunday. Well, I always taught, thought it was a Tuesday. Well, we didn't have days of the week like we have now, did we? So it's a moot point, right? 
I don't, I don't know. Okay, so one of the questions is Jay Diamond from our good friend Jay Diamond. What are the chances that the age of the Earth, the Sun, the universe will change going forward? What paradigm shift might cause a new change in age? It's hard to read because the things jiggling is. I, no, that's a very good question. Well, that's no, a we, shock that Jay asked a very good question. I'm just kidding. No, Jay. the changes come because of changes in the theories. But as time goes on, what's happening is that more and more theories from a diverse area re, region of fields is are getting interlocked. So now it's, you can't say in the early days of the age of the earth, you, if you use the different Bible translation, you could get a different result or you get something new. But now you have to be consistent through fields in biology and geology and paleontology and physics and so on. So you, a change in one field will take a long time to um, uh, impose a change on the other. So for example, you, if you might have some radical new theory that would change one result, but if the other theories are not able to accommodate that, that change will find it hard to be accepted. So one of the things that's interesting with science is that as theories get more and more interlocked, they get more and more difficult to change. You, you have to have multiple paradigm changes in multiple fields. So that's, the, uh, that's why things may not change so easily now as they did in the past. Hmm. Very, very good. Um, Eric asked, and he says, this is a little off topic, but we have a few minutes if you want to expand on it. Um, what are the current theories about what started our universe? Okay, so what started our universe, there are various theories. And as you can imagine, they're not easy to test. One is that uni the universe has gone through cycles of expansion and collapse. And that, so the, what we call the Big Bang was really the transition point between the collapse of the old university and the universe and the beginning of the new universe, the current universe. Another theory is that universes expand and then they spin off little bubbles that, that after a while the, the fabric of space time can be treated as a form and there could be a bubbles that occur that spin off into new universes. So that in that model, universes are always being created and uh, we, we could be just one of those. All these theories are kind of difficult to find experimental signatures. People, not that it, the people are working on them, but those are the various theories that we have for our universe. Now, the last talk you gave is on Copernicus. Yeah. Um, and then the talk before that is um, you'd given us when we were in the before times, as Richard Saunders keeps saying, what was the, it was on a chapter in your book, right? What was the title no, of the talk? I can't yeah. remember. No, that was about the book in general, why theories oh, of science are work so well, even though that's we can't right. prove them to be true. So those are two videos are on our YouTube channel. Um, Lois says, is what is the theory of multiverse? Okay, the, so the theory of the multiverse is similar to what I mentioned before, that the universe, the universe starts off as a compressed thing, then as it expands, it becomes flat, and then these bubbles form, and uh, new universes pop out. And the multiverse is, one of those theories. And according to the multiverse, you could have as many as 10 to the 21 universes in existence. And this is a, uh, this multiverse theory helps answer one problem, which is that the parameters of our universe are such that the universe can exist and mm -hmm. things can happen. So the, that's called the fine tuning problem, meaning that how can it be that the parameters of our universe, like the masses of particles, the forces and so on, are tuned so exactly as to produce the universe that we have? So one answer to that is, well, we are, we, that the universes, there are multiple universes, 10 to the 21, a huge number, and each of those has its own parameters. And at least all that is required is for one of those universes to have the required parameters for us to exist and we happen to live in that universe coming back like what you did with the predictions thing if you make a lot if you produce, have a large number of predictions some of those are going to come true right i mean by, by just chance so if you have a huge number of universes at least one might have the parameters needed for life as we know it to emerge right. yeah, did, did that answer your question yeah well i i the answer is I hope it answers the person who asked the question. So here we have another one from Eric. If we are in cycles of expansion and contraction, how long until the next crunch? 
<sighs> we don't know. So the point is we don't know because right now, so the question is to have a crunch, the gravitational content of the universe should be such that the current expansion will stop and come and collapse again. And that's a tricky question right now. So the idea is if the density of the universe is greater than a certain critical value, the universe will stop its expansion and, and come back and collapse. Just as if, if you throw a ball up in the air, if you throw it with a certain velocity, it will go up, reach up top and come back. Now, if the density is not sufficient, the universe will expand forever and never come to crunch again. Just like if you throw a ball up in the air fast enough, it might go out into space and you'll never get it back. Mm -hmm. So currently the best estimates of the density of the universe are that it is at the critical value. We are not sure, it's not enough to collapse it for sure. It's not enough to expand it for sure. It seems to be at that sweet spot of being flat. What, what they mean by flat is it's at the cusp of being able to collapse or expand forever. And we don't know that. So that's an interesting question too. Why is it that it's flat? Because it seems so unlikely that the density of the universe could be such that it would be exactly flat. And that's again, another one of those big unsolved questions in physics. Something to learn and more reasons for people to go into science and, and answer these big questions. Um, Rob has a question for you. He, he will ask me to ask you his opinion your opinion on the SIM hypothesis, which Neil deGrasse Tyson indicates maybe 50% and mask, I don't know who mask is, says 99.999%. Elon, Elon Musk, typo. Oh, Elon Musk. Musk. oh, mask, Musk, yeah, you know him. So the idea is that, you know- And even, explain what that is, the SIM uh, hypothesis. As I understand it. So as technology advances and we are capable of producing more and more elaborate sim computer simulations, it could be that at some point we create computer simulations in which the characters in the simulations have the, think that they are actually real. The characters in the simulation develop a consciousness or can have a consciousness that makes them think that they are real and not in a simulation. If that is the case, could it not be that we have reached that stage and we are the characters in that simulation thinking that our existence is real when actually we are in a simulation of a superior uh, um, so, I mean, I, I, I find it interesting, but I don't know what I would do with it. I mean, okay, so if you are in a simulation, we are in a simulation. Okay, but we still live a life. It doesn't change my life in any way. Oh, come I, on now. You, no, you live I mean, differently if you found it. Well, I guess you don't, if you don't know. You, yeah, yeah. How would, how would it change anything? At least it wouldn't change anything for me. Uh, it's, a, yeah, it's like... You know, it's an interesting idea, but I can't see any practical significance. If we're living under a globe in a, in a hollow earth or <laughs> a matrix. All on the matrix. Part, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. So um, what I'm going to do, since you're still going to hang around a little bit, is I'm going to bring us back to the gallery. And then that'll give us a little bit of break if people need to go to the bathroom or whatever. But I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to stay and answer any questions that people have. Sure. We, speak, we start up again at 3.15, so it's only just a few minutes from now, but okay. um, I think I'll throw it open to the grout and let everybody just, you guys can talk science for a little bit because it's kind of cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mono. It's always okay, great listening the, to you. So by the way, I, uh, Jim Stubbe, the comments, is, is a good point that the inflation theory mm. uh, is one of the explanations for why the universe is flat. I said it's, you know, so the question of why the universe is flat, there are theory as to why it's flat but why inflation is one okay i missed that one all right so let's go back over to the gallery and let's go and um if you guys have questions for mono that would be great to talk about and then we could we're going to be reconvening in just like 10 minutes 12 minutes so have at it First question, Mono, are you going to make a trivia category on this subject? <laughs> We've got would, I, many you, trivia would, I, would I tell you in advance, Rob, so that you can <laughs> read up? No. No. <laughs> I don't know if he sees that. My, my name is Eric, and I apologize if this question doesn't make sense, but <clears throat> presumably, whatever the density of the universe is now, it it, it was denser 
some time ago because it's expanding, right? But there's, this, there's presumably roughly the same amount of matter. Or right. is there something wrong with either of those assumptions I just made? Uh, okay, so when we talk of the density, we have to talk of three kinds of density. One is the ordinary matter. Yeah. Uh, that is protons, neutrons, electrons, the usual stuff that makes up our tables and chairs and so on. That density is definitely decreasing because for the same, that, that amount right. of matter is fixed, but the volume of the universe is expanding. So uh, dark matter is also a finite size. It's sort of unknown matter that has been not been directly detected as yet. And it's a in a halo around galaxies. And that is also a finite size. So the density of dark matter will also decrease with that. Right. Dark energy is a different fish altogether. It's believed to be constant in the universe. And as the universe expands, in fact, that is what's causing the universe to accelerate its expansion. The dark energy is believed to be unchanged, even as the universe expands. So that is un unchanged. That, well, that leaves me perfectly confused. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but, but that, that, okay, so, so the dark energy is a big mystery. We don't really know uh, what, what, it's, uh, what it's made of. It's, well, we say it's energy. We assume it's not matter. But I, why it is, the way, way it is, why it is exactly the amount needed to make the university flat is still an unanswered question. We can say, okay, the inflation theory says the universe should be flat. But then that's assuming that the inflation theory is the correct one. Some years ago on Star Talk, Neil deGrasse Tyson had a question and answer show. And the question was, what is dark energy and dark matter? And he said, well, I actually am sorry they ever call them that because we don't know it's energy and we don't know it's matter. They should have just called them Fred and Ethel. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's, we think it's matter because we think it has mass. And we think it's energy because we don't think it has rest mass. So uh, I think the word, the names are not bad ones. I mean, you think something has changed? That was probably a decade ago. Yeah. Well, I think you know it's dark. They call it dark matter because we can't directly see it. We can't detect it. Uh, and that people, not that people are not trying. That people are trying very hard. A couple of colleagues of mine are working very hard to tr detect dark matter, and they're coming up unsuccessful, and which is frustrating for them but they keep trying and so it's dark it's but we they do believe that these dark matter has mass it's like matter except that we haven't detected it dark energy again is like energy in the sense that there's no mass but we also haven't detected it so i think the labels are pretty good well about uh, the naming i heard complaints about the opposite that people didn't like dark because it connects them as though they're siblings and they need not be that these could be independent things is would you agree mano Oh yeah, I think they're independent things. I think the, the word dark is simply show that we haven't detected them. They're, they're, hard, they're hard to detect. Like, you know, if you're in the dark, it's hard to find things. And yeah, so that's, I think that's the only significance I give to the word dark. I don't think it implies that they're connected in any way. So you showed the formula, which <laughs> used the amount of dark energy and dark matter to estimate the age of the universe. And that kind of surprised me because I thought it was something in reverse that they had figured out the age some other way. And then they would say, okay, this is how much matter we know about, and therefore it has to be this much. And so how do we know how much dark energy and dark matter there is if we haven't detected either of those things? Oh, okay. So the idea is we, we know if the universe is flat, then we know that the sum of them adds up to 100%, uh, percent, right? If the universe is, uh, sorry, if the universe is flat, we know what the total critical energy density of the universe is. Because if the critical, there's a certain number called the critical energy density. If the energy, actual energy of the universe is greater than that, then the university is, the universe is closed, meaning it will collapse again. If it's greater than that value, it will expand forever. If it's exactly that value, it's called the critical density. If the universe is said to be flat in the sense that overall it has no curvature. But so we, we, if you start out with that assumption that the universe is flat, then we have a way of estimating the actual amount of uh, ordinary matter uh, by, you know, just the way we calculate the density of stars and matter in the universe. We have ways of calculating the dark matter because we know, we postulate that their mass has to be such that it explains properly the properties of galaxies like the spiral uh, velocities of the 
stars in the spiral arms of galaxies. So we are waves of calculating uh, dark matter. And then since the total adds up to 100%, we can then infer the value of the dark energy as what's left after you've taken into account the ordinary matter and dark matter and assuming that the total adds up to 100%. So the expression for the age of the universe if you is based on the assumption that this that the three matters add up to 100%. If that is not true, the expression for the age of the universe becomes more complicated. You know, what I gave you was in that case it becomes very simple and that's what I gave you. So that ratio of the dark energy to total energy is because we have uh, subtracted out the other two masses because we assume that they can be related to the uh, uh, dark energy ratio. Am I, do you understand? Am I being very- oh, Sort of, I'm not getting the equation in my head enough to know that that's not circular though, regarding what the age okay. is. Okay, shall, uh, shall I put the equation up again? Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to go on oh. because we're at 